Well, good morning. Let's come on in and find our places. And let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm feeling rather different today with, I'm looking into a sea of an open aisle. The wedding. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the gift of your word, for the gift of your spirit. Thank you that your word is timeless. It is just as true today as it was when you spoke it. Going all the way back to the, to the Old Testament, even into the first century now, and all these centuries ago, and yet your word is, continues to be true. Father, help us this morning as we, as we come to it that we would be able to see the faces of our own nature in it, that we would be quick to turn, that we would be encouraged by um, the fact that you are in control of history, you are in control of uh, the, the events that we face today as we see them uh, outlined even in our text today. And so, Father, help us to, to know you aright, that we may worship you aright and obey you as we should. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have gone through the pastorals, we have been seeing that uh, there's, a, there's often a, uh, a contrast that is held. This is the way that these people are, this is the way, Timothy, that you are to be. Or Titus, this is the way that you are to be. And today, we're going to run smack into um, the consequences and the ruin that comes when truth is rejected. And then on the other hand, we're going to see the blessings that come, the reward that comes from being faithful and holding on to sound words. So let's, let's tie back into um, chapter 2 and then carry forward. Let's start back in chapter 2 at verse 20. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. 
but they will not make further progress for their folly will be obvious to all just as Janus and Jambres folly was also. Now you followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, and my sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to get straight when it comes to understanding who Paul is talking about when he's talking about these men and what time period he is referring to. So for instance, in verse one in chapter three, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. This term last days has turned into a very long period of time. Now, think back and go back to the writings of Paul, the writings of James, the writings of Peter, the writings of the Apostle John, the writings of Jude, all of those men, what was the day-to-day -day expectation they had regarding the return of Christ? Imminent, right? There's that word, imminent. What does imminent mean? I'm sorry? Could occur at any time? Why can it occur at any time? Okay, it's sure to happen. Think of, think of something else. Um, is the Super Bowl imminent? Okay, I hear yes and I hear no. Why is the Super Bowl not imminent? Could that game be played today? No, it cannot be played today. Why not? The contestants haven't been chosen. There are things that have to happen before that can occur. You got to know who's going to be able to play in the game before you can have the game. So the Super Bowl, is it scheduled? I imagine it is. I imagine it's been scheduled for some time. Those are the kinds of things that you make those arrangements a long ways in advance. But it's not imminent because there are other things that must occur first before that can happen. The return of Christ is imminent because there are no intervening events that must occur for that to be able to happen. That's why it's imminent, Mary. Because we don't know the date it's going to happen. We just know it's going to happen. It could happen any minute. It could happen any minute. Well, the Super Bowl has a date. Yeah, is it scheduled? Right. It's scheduled? Is the return of Christ on God's calendar? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's there. Do we know what that day is? No, we don't. God does. And so that is going to happen as for our view of this, it is there's nothing that has to take place. There's nothing that has to transpire before that can occur. So therefore you have the apostles living in the, in the now of it could be today, it could be tonight. It could be next week, and frankly, you know, they had no knowledge, but here we are almost 2,000 years later. And where are we? The exact same place that they were. 
It could be today. So that's the idea of imminence. It's something where there's nothing else that has to take place. So this term, this idea of the last days, the last days is, is, is a period of time, and it keeps getting longer as the Lord, as the Lord again, postpones. He, he hasn't come yet, so these days are continuing on. This idea of the last days is the time between Jesus ascended and the time when Jesus is coming back. That's the idea of the last days. And so you find uh, the Apostle John writing and talking about antichrists being present in his day. Now, is that the antichrist that is spoken of in the book of Revelation? That guy hasn't shown up yet. At least he hasn't been revealed yet. It's actually a pretty cool thought when you think about that man could be living today. And if he is, then that time is now much shorter. So the idea here of the last days goes all the way from current day for Timothy. Timothy, you're already here in this time period. So for us, we are here in this same time period, in the same general setting. So the question is, is that something, and, and is it future? As Paul writes this, does he consider this to be future? Okay, I see a bunch of heads nodding. How do you tell that? Say it louder, Julie. Well, how, how does he write it? These difficult, time, these difficult times will come. So we have an idea of a future sense. Yet, the commands in verse 1, you have a command, an imperative. Realize this. And actually, there's a but in front of it. So that's going back and tying back up. That's why we read the last part of chapter 2. He's tying back to that. But, realize this. Timothy, you have to put your thinking, line your thinking up with what I am telling you, and that is a present imperative. So Timothy, you are to be thinking this way now, not in the future. This is the way you're to be thinking now. And when you go down into verse 5, we'll see a command, avoid such men as these. That is also a present imperative. So Timothy, you are going to run into men like this, and this is how you are to respond to them now in real time. So who are these men? Now when you read this list, Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Who are these guys? Are they outside the church? Okay, they're inside. Now, now, now you, go, uh, I'm sorry, Rick? Are they specifically inside the church? They are inside the church. Now, how, do, how can we tell that? What has been Paul's recurring instruction to Timothy for nine chapters now? regarding false teachers. It's, it's confront them, but what else? Put the house in order. Put the house in order, and you stay away from their doctrine. You avoid these guys. You reject these guys. Does it make a lot of, I mean, do we need to have a lot of warning, a lot of warning to confront Pagan belief? 
Well, okay, now, so the question, it's so, okay, so let's talk about this. When do we really need to be watching out for these kinds of, of teachings? Okay, when we're in the church and we're supposed to be receiving truth. The, the issue here is distinguishing between truth and, and error. You hold on to the sound words, you hold on to truth, you reject those things that purport, that are presented as being true, but they're not. That, that is a, a prime weapon of our enemy, the devil. When I was growing up, there was a saying that, you know, Satan will use a lake of truth to hide a pint of poison. And oftentimes, it's just knocking things off a little bit. You keep turning things off just a little bit and a little bit, and all of a sudden you go down the road and you are going in an entirely different direction than the, the, where you're supposed to be. And so again, this is the idea. These guys are in the church. Dave. They are in the doors. They are not in the church. They are not Christians. These guys are wolves masquerading as sheep. Uh, yesterday, I'm reading an article about a large church. And there is a huge scandal going on at this large church. This large church has become large because this man who is the primary pastor at this church preaches a health and wealth prosperity gospel. And in fact, as he preaches, the most common, according to people who have attended this church, the most common thread about this is, you know, your best life now coupled right after that with, and you need to be giving your money to this church a constant banging the drum. It's about getting the money in the plate here. And then this man was found having an affair with one of the church employees. So now there's a, he's divorced, the employee is divorced, and the cause of Christ is walking around with two shiners. Because here you have somebody who is purporting to be a man of God, and yet, what's he teaching, and how's he acting? Neither of which come in line with the gospel. And so, Timothy, again, you are going to run into this. Now again, is this news to Timothy? Is this something that Timothy has not heard before? No, it's not. Is this something that the Ephesian church is being surprised by? Is it something that, you know, somehow they would have been unaware of this danger? Okay, I see a couple heads shaking. No. Why, why is it not, why should it not be a surprise to the Ephesian church? Acts 20, exactly. Acts 20, when Paul, the elders come to meet Paul, He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he tells them, from among yourselves. This is not somebody, you know, from the outside sneaking in. This is arising from you. From among your own selves, men will arise, who will, who will try to draw away the flock. And so again, this is something that was a clear and present danger for the Ephesians. Now again, as you read this list, you know, there's 19 characteristics here. And you're not necessarily gonna have each and every one of them present in these men. But notice that those 19 are bracketed by love. It's just not a good kind of love. 
They aren't, they aren't concerned about love for the Savior. Frankly, they're not concerned about love for the flock. What, do they, what are they concerned about loving? Themselves. Lovers of self. Lovers of money. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. As you read as you read these, can you see how even in the church today, in many places in the church, this is prevalent? What is one of the well, oh, that's a silly question. There's a lot of answers to that question. You have Two men that have been enemies, bitter enemies. And they're exposed to the gospel and they believe the gospel. And they repent and they submit to the gospel. What happens to the relationship between these two men who formerly have been at odds when they were unredeemed, and now all of a sudden they're redeemed, what so often, and there's so many pictures that you can go to, so many examples, what happens to their relationship? They're reconciled. Now why can they be reconciled? Exactly. We are at war with God. We are enemies with God. We have no ability to have any relationship with God. The gospel changes that, right? We are justified. We're sanctified. And all of a sudden, we who once were afar off have now been what? We've been brought near in the blood of Christ. God is in the reconciling business, right? God took our certificate, God has reconciled us to himself because he took our certificate of debt and nailed it to the cross of Jesus. And praise God for that, right? That same reconciliation then becomes available to men who have been formerly enemies. And in fact, that is the norm. It shouldn't be anything that's terribly surprising. What should be getting our attention is that when all of a sudden in Christendom you have the idea that these two people or these two sides or whatever cannot be brought together. They are irreconcilable. Something's wrong. Something's de dreadfully wrong. So, so we just went, got through in our home fellowship groups going through fault lines, right? Talking about critical race theory. What's one of the tenets of critical race theory? Can the two sides be reconciled? No, they can't. That ought to be a clue right up front that something is dreadfully wrong when you have a, a, a doctrine being preached that you have people who cannot be brought together, not even through the blood of the cross, there's a problem. And so you've got these traits that are growing and they, and they grow out of selfishness. Now again, can a Christian be selfish? Okay, every head in the room should be nodding up and down vigorously, right? Why do we have, for those of us who are married, why do we have issues from time to time in our marriages? Well, because, you know, hey, look, everything would go fine if, if, if she would just do things my way. We wouldn't have any conflict. 
unfortunately, what's, what, what, what can be being said at the exact same time? <laughs> we wouldn't be having any problems at all if he would just do what he should, if he would do things my way. And so again, the idea of selfishness, look, we're, we're all very acquainted with that, right? You run into trouble, though, when that is what characterizes your life. And in fact, should selfishness characterize my life if I'm redeemed? Boy, it better not. It had better not. And he died for all that those who live should what? No longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And so again, if these things, as you go through this list, if those things characterize my life, then shouldn't there be some alarms going off as to why are these things so? The danger of people like this is that they want to have the appearance of holiness without actually having the requirements for holiness. It's about how things appear without having the inner truth. And what happens? You have these people, these men, who are coming in and their intent is to lead astray. Their intent is to draw away. And they find targets. In, the, in our passage here, for among them, this isn't absolutely every one of them, but for, from among them, are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighted down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, is Paul bashing women here? No, he's not. The issue here is deception. And these women that he's referring to are prime targets for deception because they're already living in a way that's not dealing with sin and dealing with truth properly. And so they become targets for someone coming along and trying to sell them something and again, it's not selling them something. It's not giving them something for their benefit. The false teachers, when they, when they peddle what it is that they have to, to, to peddle, it's because it's for their benefit, not for the benefit of the, of the sheep. They're not, they're not interested in helping the sheep to grow. They're interested in fleecing the sheep. That's what they want to do. And so, and again, always learning, never able, able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now there's a spiral you do not want to get caught up in. Always accumulating things. In fact, in the next chapter, how is he going to put it? These people, they want to, they, they look for teachers who are going to tickle their ears. It's not about be, be, being confronted with the truth, where then I need to submit to the truth. It's telling them something that'll make them happy and just sucks them further down the path to ruin. Now, Janice and Jambres, Paul does something here, and Paul's not afraid to do this. What's one of, again, he's been combating 
these false teachers who don't major in the truth. These are the guys who like to go for genealogies. These are the guys who like to bring in all these philosophical questions so that we can talk and talk and talk and talk and never actually speak anything that matters a hill of beans. So Paul here brings up a couple of men. You'll not find these men's words, in the Old, these men's names in the Old Testament. You will not find them there. Paul is actually drawing something that appears to be from Jewish tradition. And these two men were purportedly Egyptians in Egypt. Excuse me, magicians in Egypt. Of course you would find Egyptians in Egypt. And these are some of the guys who were counseling Pharaoh in opposition to Moses. Now, when you have the magicians trying to do their reproductions of the, uh, the things that God had given Moses to be able to do to convince Pharaoh of who God was and by, by inference who Moses was representing, were these men opposing Moses only? Okay, Rick, you're shaking your head. Why are they not opposing just Moses? What else are they opposing? Because Moses is carrying, exactly, he's carrying God's message. And so it's not just against Moses, it's against the truth that Moses is presenting from God. And that's how he goes through here and then talks. These guys are like those guys. So they're not opposing me. They're opposing the truth that I am proclaiming that God has given me. And so, now, and, and so how does, can you see how that might actually help Paul in his perspective of how to view the things that are occurring to him? They're not opposing me. I'm collateral damage here. They're opposing Christ. They're opposing the truth. And frankly, if I am representing the truth and they are not representing the truth, they're representing error, I hope that I am catching flack. I'd better be catching it because otherwise something's wrong. I'm not pushing the message enough. Or somehow, you know, am I trying to water it down? So these guys are, they're, they're trying to come up with an alternate narrative. There's another way to, to look at these things. Mary. Yep. I'm sure you found that yourself. You know, that it's just a spiritual thing. You know, and if you didn't have Christ in you and you were just in the world like they are, you would have been good friends. You bet. But there's just this wall. Right. I don't know if they know it, but you can uh, Yeah. We should be facing these very same things today. We should be. And now, and again, so the idea on our part is, we, as, as the messenger, you don't want to interfere with the message. So you don't want to be, you know, a knucklehead to people. That's why, again, it, 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 it just strikes me time and time again in the pastorals, the emphasis on Timothy, ty you need to be kind, you need to be patient, you need to be gentle, you need to... Uh, you need to endure, and you need to endure cheerfully because you're going to run into opposition. And sometimes it's going to be bitter opposition. Sometimes it's going to be physical opposition. Paul here in a little bit is going to talk about, you know, the events that happened to him at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra. 
What happened to Paul at Lystra? Not beaten. He was stoned and left for dead. By the way, that was on his first missionary journey. Who, who lived at Lystra? Who's from Lystra? Timothy is. So Timothy knows about these things. He's been with Paul when he's been beaten. Timothy was in Philippi when Paul and Silas were beaten there. He's fully aware of the physical ramifications of standing for and proclaiming truth. And Paul is on him. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ or of my gospel. You don't, be, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of my chains. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure these things with me. And so much more here as, as he's writing this book. You need to learn how to endure these things because the time is coming soon when you're not going to be enduring them with me. I'm going to be gone. And you're going to be picking up this mantle. So again, in Timothy's day, you have those who are rejecting the truth. They're rejecting the God himself. And that is one of the things here that becomes, uh, verse 8, they oppose the truth. That idea of opposing is, again, standing in opposition to. Uh, the same word is used. They oppose the truth as you and I are to resist the devil. That's the other common way that this word is, is translated. So when it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you, same word. They're of depraved mind. And they're rejected in regard to the faith. This idea of being rejected, they have been tested. Uh, it's, like the, it's like the writing on the wall in, in Daniel. You know, here comes this disembodied hand. Ju -ju 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 crawls over to the wall, many, many, tekel a parson. You've been weighed, you've been found wanting, and... You're going to lose your kingdom. You've been rejected. In 2 Corinthians 13, when it talks about being examined and found and either failing the test or passing the test. In fact, uh, flip a few, ver uh, few pages over to 2 Corinthians so we can quote it accurately. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? That's the idea. That's the same word that's being used over here in Timothy when it talks about these men are rejected in regard to the faith. They've been examined and they've been found to be not genuine. Now, as a pastor, that, if we stopped right there as a pastor, that would be utterly terrifying. That's terrifying. So why is it, as a Christian, that you can actually proceed with confidence in service to Christ in the face of this truth. I'm hearing crickets. Why? Is this truth the only truth? Ah, it's not the only truth. There are others, such as God works all things after the counsel of his own will, such as I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There are other truths as well. Right. Is 
this the same type of situation that he's referring to? Like this, I mean, I have this qualified regarding their faith. I mean, we understand they were never saved in one sense, how they They're just qualified to have faith, but then all of a sudden, they're rejected, it's gone. There are some who never will, yes. So here again, and, and do you know which camp they're gonna fall into? Are these people who have rejected Christ and they, they are set aside? Or are these people who, if you go back up into chapter two, are these people who can come to their senses? Do you know which camp they fall into? You don't. So, how do you deal with them? You go back up into chapter 2 when it talks about the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. But be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So again, for us, you confront the error. You take that on. You are to reject a factious man after a first and second warning. If you have people who do not hold to our doctrine, you are to have nothing to do with them, yet, you don't treat them as an enemy, but you admonish them as a brother. Again, you're being kind to them. You are being patient with them, but you are not condoning their, true, their, their, their false teaching, and you are not uh, letting them just come in and, and, and do whatever it is. So I do not have the ability to be able to tell for anybody as to whether or not they can be saved or they are saved. So is Paul using his apostolic kind of authority to determine this or is it uh, their state of mind? You know, because it's, these men also, well, there's men corrupted in their mind and therefore they're disqualified because their mind is corrupted. So you're suggesting if they turn from that state, Yes. Yes. So in their current state, in the corruption of their mind, they're, they're just, they can't, there's no room for faith. Faith cannot coexist. Correct. Correct. And so, um, Correct. We approach every man with the intent to see him turn to Christ in repentance. We confront every man, as you said, gently, patiently, respectfully, uh, always with a hope for their turning. But, you know, it, it may have been that it was revealed to Paul certain things. Jesus certainly knew who's in and who's out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 Paul, back in uh, 1 Timothy, spoke about how he had turned
turned these men over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. But not just simply for their destruction, it was also that they would, through that, be brought back over here to the truth. Uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians, you need to deal with this man who is being sexually immoral in a way that even the Gentiles don't do because your toleration of him is an abomination to God. This man needs to be separated. But yet in 2 Corinthians, you find that the, it had, it, the, the, the removal, his removal from their fellowship had the desired end. He came to repentance and he turned away from that sin. And so what was Paul's instruction? Take him back. Take him back and love on him. And so the idea here again is um, we are to be valiant for truth. But we are to do that in such a way as God has dealt with us patiently, kindly, gently, making it to where it's about the message and never about me trying to browbeat somebody into the kingdom. Does that work? It really doesn't. Sir. The, the idea of Hebrews 6 is if you have someone who understands the gospel, I am at war with God. I am under his condemnation, rightly so, because I have sinned. And I realize that God has provided a way of salvation. He has, he has sent his son to live a perfect life a sinless life, 
to be the propitiation, to be the substitute for me, to pay the penalty for my sin. And I, I get that stuff. And I still, I then come to the point where, no. I will not have this man to rule over me. Paul talks about he was able to come to salvation because the persecution that he did, he did in ignorance. He thought that he was doing God's service by persecuting Christians and persecuting the church. But on the road to Damascus, when he was confronted by Jesus, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And all of a sudden, Paul comes to realize who Jesus is, that he is in fact the Son of God, the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. And all of a sudden, oh, it's when you've had that exposure. I, I am. There's a. Well, and, and it won't be against anyone else's desires either. God shut it, but they were just as obstinate. I, I got to tell you, I, I, I'm, th I'm thinking right now of one of my sons. And he looks at Hebrews 6. And he goes, well, gee whiz, am I out? He has been, he grew up in this church. He's heard the truth. He knows the truth. He hasn't bowed his knee to the truth. And where is he at? And I'll tell you, I don't know. Is he, in he is he one of those in Hebrews 6? I don't know. So what do I do? I keep preaching the gospel to him. Point him in the way that he should go. That's the only thing I can do. And so, again... Paul is all about guarding the truth. You protect it. You stand for it against any and all opposition, regardless of the cost to you. You stand for the truth. It's not going to happen today because we're not going to finish chapter 3 today. Um, but next, at the end of the chapter, he, he uses a term, you know, the man of God. That's a term that Paul has applied to Timothy. But you, O oh man of God, I was hoping to be able to take some time to trace that out a little bit as to what it is, you know, scripturally, who is a man of God? Who are the men who bore that title? And it's those who proclaim God's truth. Moses was a man of God. Elijah, Elisha. One guy, there's an Old Testament prophet. That is the only name that we have for him. He was the man of God because he proclaimed God's truth and God's word. So, the bottom line to this, why should we not become despairing? Why should we not become fearful? We don't do these things because we also have the other truths. 
Can God's will be, I love this word, thwarted? Can somehow you blunt or misdirect or deflect God's attack? No. No. It can't be done. And so, and, and that ultimately, that gives me, and I hope it gives you great hope. We continue, we, we, we learn the truth so that we may obey the truth so that then we may proclaim the truth. Does that sound familiar somewhere? If you were in Ezra and Nehemiah some months ago, you would see that's, uh, what is that? I believe that is Ezra 7.10. Ezra had set his heart to know the truth, to know the to obey it, to know the law, to obey it, and then to teach it. That's the right triad for that. Questions? That was a good question. And really, when you look, and, and Ed is talking about Matthew 7, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There, there is a horrifying word in that passage. Many. In fact, flip back to it, into Matthew 7. Okay, let's go here just real quick, and then we'll, we'll do that. So Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So what again, what's, what's put up front, right up front, it's not just hearing. It is hearing that must be accompanied by doing. James, don't be a hearer of the word only, right? And so deceive yourselves, right? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And he moves right into, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man. And so again, it's, it goes back to continually, it's not just what is said, it is what is done. You cannot have a Christian who just talks the talk. It has to be followed with, is the conduct, does that conduct line up with that? We're going to run into that when we push through the rest of chapter 3. Dave. Dave. Well, I tell, so the question is, did everybody hear the question? Okay, so the idea here is this. There's not a red dot or a little red E on the forehead of those who are the elect. So, you proclaim the truth. Paul, 
considered himself the foremost of sinners. Again, not, and that wasn't, uh, you know, this is a trustworthy statement, worthy of full. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I was foremost. No, I am foremost. There are some who, you know, look, I've sinned too much. Jesus' blood covers any and every sin, any and every and all, every and all. I've rejected the truth. Do I, does that mean that I'm out? I don't know. Because again, I don't have the ability to be able to say with confidence based on God's word that I'm sorry, but you are somehow excluded based on my word. Does that day come for some? Yes, it does. But that's in God's purview and in God's knowledge alone. So again, I just proclaim truth. Well, the word to add to, to your statement about I don't know who the elect are, I don't know who are judicially hardened. And neither do you. Yeah. Do you wish to be saved? Do you want to be healed? You show me a verse that says you're forbidden to come. Right. Yeah. Great point. Other questions? Todd. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. You have two different things in mind there. You have the, the second coming of Christ when he comes in power and great glory, when he is coming to establish his kingdom on the earth, uh, the millennial kingdom. Then you also have the rapture, which is the removal of the church. And that is, uh, that is imminent. The other, there are things that are going to happen. Uh, we're gonna get into that at length. Uh, starting next month when we, when we study the book of Revelation. And so we're going to see that there are many things that God lays out uh, in such a way that you're going to have this, 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 and there's a timetable laid out too. And so the, the imminent, uh, the rapture of the church, that is imminent. That can happen in five seconds. It might not happen for another five decades five centuries. We don't know the answer to that. So that, that would be the difference there. Others? Okay, great questions this morning. Teacher is happy. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, how glorious a thing it is that you, in fact, are the one who is all-powerful, who is all-wise, whose plans can never be set aside. You and your wisdom have ordained all of these things to come. You have selected some. You haven't selected all. You didn't have to select any. And so, Lord, we are grateful. We are... Um, we can never say thank you enough. And Lord, we're also hopeful for those that we know who at this moment do not know you, who do not walk in your ways, who have not come to the point of repentance. And Lord, for them, we pray that you would draw them, that you would use us, that we would be able to speak your truth consistently, Lord, most of all, that we would live it consistently, that they would be able to see the effect, the changing effect of the gospel. I was blind, now I see. I was condemned, now I'm adopted. 
Lord, any, anything that's good in us is only because of you. It is only because of the effect of your spirit working in us. And so, Lord, help us to be humble, but also help us to be persistent. Not deterred, not turned away. Oh, Lord, help us to be faithful that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who died and rose again on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen.